Hello, everybody. Good evening and welcome to this evening's Humanist UK event. I will now conjure up as if by magic Julian Pagini. There he is, uh, who is, of course, uh, our guest this evening uh, for the next in what's proving to be a very popular little series of humanist chats. Um, some of you may have been at one or other of them. Uh, this evening, of course, will be the best. Julian, welcome. Um, you are... <laughs> Thanks for having me. I've got a lot of the buttons now. Thank you. <laughs> yes, you have. Um, you're one of the more productive uh, humanist philosophers that I know. You're parallel only with um, perhaps AC Grayling in terms of, it seems to me anyway, the number of volumes that you managed to put out there, um, all of them uh, extremely engaging and covering a, a very diverse range of topics um, from, you know, Jesus to uh, all the rest. And so as a result, I'm sure you're going to be happy to answer questions on any of your wide uh, range of, of publications this evening. And that's something that we will get uh, from participants who are here as the hour rolls on. And I want to encourage you, if you're watching, to put your questions into the question and answer um, box. Um, that's where uh, there's been most lively discussion uh, in the last few of these uh, sessions. So don't be shy, get uh, typing your, your questions in straight away. Um, I'm only the beginning uh, of the conversation with Julian. It's about all of you here, uh, virtually present, uh, more than me. We're going to talk this evening about your latest, um, as I say, in a long line of excellent books, which I'm going to hold up to the screen, which is about David Hume, which is, I really think, a much better person to be writing about than Jesus. <laughs> um, maybe we'll, come, we'll come back on to Jesus possibly later, but this is a much more congenial personality, David Hume, in many ways. Um, obviously, he's become little You'd rather scandalous. You'd be with Hume than Jesus, I have to say. Much I think that is rather. True. Absolutely right. A or nice glass of something. Drink of your choice. Yeah. Yes, of course. Well, I think with David Hume, it would be. It wouldn't. It wouldn't be a non-alcoholic drink. But um, you're right. Why? Why David Hume? Then why have you chosen to write about Hume? Well, look, there's actually um, a very uh, long story about this book. It had a very interesting uh, genesis because actually it started with an invitation from a South Korean publisher to contribute a volume to a series they had on, which was the idea was they called it a journey through. And it was like looking at ideas and works of artists, writers, philosophers, scientists by following them on a journey. And uh, Hume wasn't on their list. Aristotle was already taken. But I thought, you know, I really wanted, I thought, let's see if they'll do Hume for the reason that I love Hume, but in the same way that I love, um, I don't know, Thomas Hardy and I love uh, various people like this, you know, it actually, I hadn't at that point read the half of it, you know, I liked what I've seen and I, I kind of wanted an excuse <laughs> to actually commit myself to really reading everything and looking at it really carefully. And they said yes to Hume. And what's happened here is the, the book you just held up is not exactly the book I wrote for them. Um, researching it, I just, I actually did think that this was, I really liked <laughs> um, writing it. And I increasingly thought that, you know, Hume is not a philosopher who is that well known outside of philosophy. People may know who he is, is right? but you know, he's a, his ideas are not really that well known. So I think there's, you know, and if you know, look, look for popular books on Hume, there's been a few biographies, but you know, nothing really huge. So I thought it was kind of a book that could be useful and needed. And so what happened was, long story short, um, Princeton University Press acquired, acquired the rights for the English version, but that English version is substantially reworked from the, the, the Korean one. And so that, that's how. So I was given the opportunity to spend more time with Hume and I leapt at it. And that makes sense of some of the, of the way that the book is structured, really, which does sort of trace, um, you know, it's like going for a walk with Hume, although I suppose it was a very great walk. It's like going going in a in a carriage ride with Hume, <laughs> in a way, and sort of almost like conversing with him because the way you present it is these different yeah. under these different headings, um, and th that's that's obviously explains does it that the origin of that narrative. Well, that's journey. right. I mean, the, the, the journey aspects are very much toned down from the Korean version, but some remains because the point is that, you know, I told the story, you know, by following his life and by going to some of those places where he was, you know, which is, which is interesting. You know, you, you might argue it adds nothing, but in, in some ways, I think it is always, there was, it was something really curiously curious about going to where great people were, isn't it? I find this interesting, again, from a humanist perspective as well. 
um, you know, sacred sites for the religious are sort of endowed with some kind of, you know, holy mystique or something. But as a completely secular person, you can go to, say, Wittgenstein's Hut in, in Norway, which is amazing, you know. And, and well, it's amazing. It's not, it wasn't amazing until recently. It was just the foundations and there was nothing there until they rebuilt oh, really? it. Maybe but I remember not. going there before they rebuilt it. And there was something that you, you feel this strange kind of connection, this, 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 and this kind of wonder, really. <clears throat> I think this is the thing that makes it from a humanist perspective interesting, that, you know, our lives are finite, we die, we go. In, this, in some ways we leave no trace, and yet we do. And if, you know, through our, our, our lives, our works, through how we're remembered. And that way in which we connect with people who are, who are actually literally completely gone, mm. and yet they, we connect them through those places, I, I find that can be quite a touching experience. It's difficult, isn't it? Actually, I can't think of what it would be like to go to Edinburgh not knowing that that was where David Hume once was, um, because I've always you know, gone to Edinburgh knowing that. You know, I went there first time as an adult. And I think you're right. You you do um, get a sense of place. Do you get it with David Hume more than others? I mean, apart from Wittgenstein's hut apart, um, because he's very much isn't here a creature of his environment. Did you um, find when you're yeah, getting to know him better? It, it, yeah, I think it depends where you go. I mean. In Paris, I was actually, it's astonishing mm. that given how much Paris kind of revels in its kind of history, um, all these great sites of the Enlightenment, most of them are, are completely unmarked. There's hardly even a plaque to, to, to you know, Don Bear's house where he had his, uh, you know, great parties. There's not even a plaque on the wall, you know. Um, but, but in other places, yes. And Edinburgh, I think everything about Edinburgh is, it's a wonderful city. It's, it's one of my favourite British cities after the one I live in, which is Bristol. And it, it, is, it is amazing. And I think you, you get that feeling even now of somewhere that has that kind of vibrancy and cosmopolitanism, you know. I mean, that it feels like an enlightened thing. place, I think. It feels like it. the landscape is an enlightened landscape, you know, in, in, the, in the Newtown broad <laughs> thoroughfares and um, even elsewhere. Yeah. It has a, a thoughtful air. Yeah, but then oh, you I also, like more. With, with, with historical knowledge, you have a not, you know, an air, where, awareness of how squalid the, the yeah. old town was. You, know, yeah. you couldn't go, you wouldn't dare walk the streets at night for fear of someone emptying their chamber pot on your head, basically. Yeah, it's still like that. <laughs> it had a reputation. <laughs> <laughs> it's a reputation of the stinkiest cities in, in, in Europe. But yeah, I mean, so I, I think, I think you, you get something from it for sure. But I mean, I, I, I hopefully sort of, I mean, his, his life is, is there, absolutely, because I think that I didn't want to kind of, I wanted to look at his life and work as a whole, and I think there were good reasons for that. The actual sort of more travelogy bits, are, 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 I hope, fairly, fairly light and not distracting. I think they add something. As, as you got to know him better, you got to know him better, um, obviously, in the course of your, your reading and your imaginative engagement with him I suppose as well because I always think that with David Hume you, you have to imagine yourself talking with him almost you, re you read it and then you think about chatting with him um what what was it that well what was it that surprised you I suppose and was there anything that uh, didn't surprise you but that you grew to a, a greater appreciation of more than other things yeah and in terms of surprise actually I think what is surprising is that I mean I think he clearly was some kind of form of genius but what is surprising and I think rather chastening is despite that on more than one on several occasions he sort of doesn't quite go as far with a line of thought in the political or the ethical dimension as we would like him to have done you know wouldn't it be great if we could show that Hume was a proto-feminist now mm. actually but we can't show that I mean clearly he was you know not as misogynistic, I think, as the average person of his time, et cetera, et cetera. But he, he again, he did talk about, you know, females being the more delicate sex and, and so forth. Obviously, there's a notorious footnote he made about the Negro species. Yes, I think we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Um, he also, I mean, but it, it, there's one essay in particular. These essays, by the way, are really, really interesting. You, you, don't, you don't study them today. They're hard, you know, they're only a few even to buy them, you know, it's quite an obscure edition. Um, but his essays are really fascinating. And he had one on polygamy and divorces. And it's almost like in two acts. In the first part, he gives these arguments which you could read, you could imagine them being written in the 20th century about how all this is contingent on tradition and how, you know, to, 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 to force people 
to stay together, you know, um, in, when, when their lovers died is a kind of oppression. And it sounds brilliant. But it is on the other hand, <laughs> and he offers like conservative arguments why if we allowed for divorce and polygamy and stuff, it would be dangerous for children. It would sort of remove that incentive for people to stick it out and work on things. And he ends up yeah. concluding, do you know what? Our current practices are pretty much right. So I think in the end of the day, his, his kind of ultimate conservatism in matters political and social. That was the surprise. Was surprising and disappointing. Yeah, absolutely. But as you say in the book, and this is, I think, something I've always, you know, everyone sort of thinks about um, in relation to him on religious questions, but maybe it's true in these other questions too. As you say in the book, um, it wasn't that easy for him, even in polite society. He was almost um, censured by the Assembly of the Church of Scotland or even more, you know, prosecuted, wasn't it, by the Church of Scotland. Um, he, you know, he, he lost out in his life on job opportunities and other um, aspects of his career because of having sort of scandalous or semi-scandalous or forthright opinions or controversial opinions on a, on a lot of um, areas. Is that is that why he pulled back sometimes then on some of these questions, do you think? Do you get any sense of whether or not it's, it's intellectual reluctance or cowardice to go down a more scandalous route? Or did he genuinely, do you think, actually stop because it's hard to believe think, that he he actually for me it's hard to believe that he actually wasn't a sort of um uh more atheistic than he appears i know all the okay well on that issue i mean on the issues i've talked about i think he was just expressing his views because he was i don't okay. think he was holding back for that on on, on the okay. on the religious issue i think it's actually really really interesting i mean there's no doubt at all he's self-censured he, and you see it in his letters he admits that um, you know, one of his works, he, he, he didn't dare publish whilst he was still alive. Is that and, suicide? Um, in the, yeah, yeah. The, so on the suicide, but I'm also the, I think the dialogues or natural religion. Oh, yes, that's right. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and in the treaties, um, the, 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 he, his chapter on miracles does end up getting published eventually when he reworked the treaties as the essays in later life. But in, in the in, in the treaties, he, he didn't include his his sceptical treatment of of. Uh, miracles and he, he he kind of regretted that he he he, he said he had like castrated his own work yeah. and moved its yeah. better parts and everything and so he was definitely very cautious about it but but and i think this is a key thing i when you look at what he says in the round i don't think that was because he was um a kind of what would you call it the the kind of very the kind of very up and open and blunt atheist we'd see today. He, he no. was, to all accounts, genuinely shocked by how atheist the French philosophers were. Mm. He thought this kind of wasn't warranted. And he's a bit, he does remind me a lot of what uh, a lot of things Russell said, actually, Bertrand Russell. I mean, Bertrand Russell is this, this lovely little comment which I trot out all the time where he says, because we, you know, Humanists will be used to this. If people go into you say, shouldn't you really be an agnostic? You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really, really tiresome. Now, but Russell's <laughs> answer is a very rigorous one. He's saying there is a sense in which, you know, technically speaking, you should be ag agnostic because, you know, you obviously cannot show there's, there's no God and proof and everything. But it would be misleading to say that because if you say someone, you're an agnostic, it makes it sound like you think, well, it could be, you know, 50-50. Whereas actually someone like Russell and Hume, I think, they had no real, you know, for all practical purposes, you know, they didn't have to worry about this, this no, kind of... No, it was besides the point, almost. It was besides the point, and so it was a kind of a dead hypothesis for them. Yeah. But I think he would have, from all we know about him, would have been quite keen to, to, to sort of keep insisting that's not the same as saying absolutely not, you know. Mm. And, mm. And, and I think he thought that was quite important in general because he was always against overstating the mark when it comes to um, empirical matters. I mean, even that notorious race uh, comment he made you know he did he, he i am apt to suspect is what he said at the beginning of it he didn't yes. assert it as a fact right because you know he he was wrong about what he asserted but you know he he, he he wasn't wrong because he was convinced of something he was wrong because he thought this was most likely to be true and, and it absolutely wasn't let's come on to that since you've mentioned it we've got our first question in the chat which i'll ask in a minute but please people here do do, do ask questions it takes some, some time to get warmed up perhaps but um since you mentioned that uh footnote of mm. 
now a notorious one because of the way it's been excavated and represented and mm. um, used as a reason to remove David Hume's name off um, buildings named in his honour, for example, or other, bring him into disrepute. Mm. Um, what's your, what, what is your view on that as having spent time in David Hume's company during the time that that whole thing was unfolding? Do you think yeah. that he, well, what do you think about it? I think it's I think it's really difficult because I think maybe you should just spell out what it was actually because not everyone here well, might might, might it, know what it was. Okay, so it, it's an essay on national character, and there's, there's a footnote. Now the point is that you know the very fact that it's a footnote itself might say someone shouldn't make too much of it, but he did revise his works and they were republished, and he always kept in the footnote and only revised it very very gently, so the essence remained the same. And he it was basically apt to suspect the Negroes and the other species of, of basically non-whites, of which there are many, to be inferior on the basis that you know their civilizations have basically never produced the kind of things that the, the Western civilizations have done. Mm -hmm. A very kind of crude crude view, and some an people argue view. That, an ignorant view, and yeah. one that um, people would suggest. Um, suggests that he believed this idea, which was popular at the time, that the human race essentially did have subspecies, that we weren't all one species, and that yeah, the Negro race was a separate species or human to, to the whites, and, and as were a lot of the other um, species. And so he put that in a footnote, and it's obviously completely wrong. Um, now, the question is, is how damning is that? And I think there are two ways it could be uh, really damning. I mean, it's clearly wrong. He was clearly mistaken, and you know that the sentiment should be absolutely condemned. But for it to be damning, it, I think there are two ways it could be. The first is if it were the case that this isn't wasn't just a one-off misjudgment, that it actually revealed something systematically flawed in his way of looking at the world. Okay, and this kind of way of interpreting a lot of, of history, I think, is is quite popular in. Uh, these days that we kind of, you know, we, we, we see how colonial mindsets, for example, infect the way everybody thinks. So you get people arguing that, you know, the whole of Kant, for example, is, you know, Kant wouldn't have thought what Kant thought if he, if he didn't have a colonial mindset, this kind of argument. Mm. But in the case of Hume, it, it just, you know, anyone who knows Hume, I think, knows that this simply isn't true. Hume was a, a empiricist. He believed in basing his views on the evidence and to be, belief should be proportioned to the evidence. And there is nothing in his general system which uh, suggests that it would lead inevitably to colonialism or, or racism. In fact, the exact opposite. Uh, the, the same kind of argument, by the way, was made by Ed Edith Hall, wrote a book about Aristotle. Aristotle, I was going to say, it's very like Aristotle, the idea yeah. that if Aristotle, Aristotle was here today or Hume was here yeah, today, they exactly. would say different things. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Aristotle was a misogynist. But again, you know, his method was, you know, was, was observational experimental. And Edith Hall, as a woman, as a very, um, you know, liberated woman in the 21st century, has no problem at all with Aristotle's misogyny because she can see that that's not integral to the system and he just wouldn't believe it today. Mm. I think that's mm. absolutely, absolutely clear. The second thing is though, uh, which would be more damning would be, well, not more damning, that would be the most damning, but another thing that would be troubling would be if this was a view he held at a time when you know, he really should have known better. Now, I think this is where the debate gets more interesting. The, the historian Tom Devine has come out very, very strongly saying that people accusing Hume of racism here are simply not understanding what the society was like at the time and how exceptional it'd have to be for him not to have thought something like this. Critics point to people like you know, Beattie, who wrote the people who had, you know, who had written on this issue, had, had argued that Hume was wrong, to show that you know, there were plenty of people around at that time yes, exactly. who could see that this was wrong and that he should have known better. And I think that, you know, I don't, in, I, I would like to just go with divine. And I did wonder whether or not in the book I was, you know, being so careful not to excuse Hume that I actually damned him too much. <laughs> I think in the end, you know, I think you just got a middle position. <clears throat> I think this was a flaw. It was a definite flaw. We can criticise from it. It wasn't inevitable he would have thought this. But I think it is extremely understandable given the time that he did. And in addition to that, you know, this, this, is, this was something that Hume wrote on lots of issues and this wasn't one of his main concerns. 
And I think there is a kind of, I, I really dislike the kind of form of self-righteousness whereby people say that because we're so convinced, you know, that we can see the error of the ways so easily, we're convinced that, you know, we could never be guilty of any kind of similar prejudice ourselves were we in the same position, therefore Hume must be wrong. It's the same kind of, you know, complacency that leads people to think that, you know, if they were growing up in Nazi Germany... Yes, you know, exactly, they, they would be They would the definitely would have been person, in the resistance, <laughs> you know, et cetera, et cetera. I think we just know that even... even these flaws can be brought out with people. So it's a stain. I, I say it's a genuine stain on his character. It's a genuine thing against him. Yes. But that, um, but, the, but that does not mean it wipes out everything else. It doesn't mean we have good reasons to, to admire him and like him still. Okay, I think that's clear. Um, was Hugh, here's a question from uh, David. Warden, was Hugh married and did he have children? He was a great bachelor, wasn't he? Uh, he was a great bachelor. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Was he a bachelor? Or yeah, that's a that, question that's a, that people yeah, I know. often ask I know. historic it's an interesting figures. one, that. I mean, you do have to kind of raise, raise it. I don't, I just think we would never know, to be honest. I mean, right. we just have no idea why he was a bachelor. He did seem to have a couple of sort of relationships which kind of didn't go anywhere. As a young man, there's some cryptic comments in some letters which suggest that um, he, 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 was, he, he had a sort of relationship which we thought could go someone who was younger, um, he had a very kind of um, Madame de Buffler, Buffet. I, I'm, like, I'm terrible with names. I can't get it right. So one of these salonistas in in um, yes. Paris who understood. He had he had his, his letters to her and her letters to him. They're very sort of at times very intense. Well, they were as though they were in love in some kind of way. But it was an impossible situation anyway. It wouldn't have worked. She was with some count and, uh, and oh, all right. that no kind of thing. Um, and then in later life, she had a very, again, really tender letters with this woman called Nancy Ord, who sounds like a, a very kind of modern and sort of a free-thinking, intelligent, bright woman, much younger than him. And again, in his letters to her, it kind of suggests the fact that, it suggests that he did he did kind of love her in a way, but knew it was kind of ridiculous for someone of his age to entertain such fantasies and therefore didn't do anything about them. But, you know, could, could it, it, it look, if he, if he, if he just, if he was, if he was gay, we just would never have known. And there's nothing, there's nothing to suggest he was, but then, um, and then you sometimes ask yourself, well, what, what, what would suggest it? You know? Exactly. I mean, what would the suggestive <laughs> evidence be? Not <laughs> how, how can you know such a thing? So, you know, I, I think it's just not really worth speculating. But I think what's yeah. most interesting, though, is that in terms of how we think about the good life, et cetera, I do kind of find it a little bit sad that yes. even when I was younger, the, the idea of the sort of the bachelor, the bachelor life as a, as a noble thing, as a, as a perfectly legitimate um, way of doing things. And, and, and now it seems, you know, if you're a bachelor, it seems either, well, in, in, not so long ago, people would say, oh, he's a bachelor in inverted commas. Yeah, exactly. Now that's kind of gone, but people just think, oh, is something wrong with you? Something weird about you? And, you know, there's, it's not weird. Not everyone feels the need to have... No, a, and indeed, you know, and it, would, it would, wasn't an unusual life. No. Not an unusual lifestyle, actually, at all. I, I always it wish that David Hume and George Eliot had lived at the same time, because I think they could have got, <laughs> I think they could have got together. <laughs> That's Your who I'd like to see. Historical yeah. matchmaking. Historical there's a book matchmaking. in this, Andrew. There's there a is. book in this. <laughs> Um, there's a question blind from Sue. <laughs> yeah, blind history. That's good, actually, isn't it? Yeah, you, we could do that. Um, no, I don't think they'd have. I think they'd have combined very happily. They could have been, yeah. you know, lived together well. Uh, Sue asks about um, Hume's early years. Um, was his in his early life? Were his early years grounded in conventional Christianity, which he later questioned, or were his parents relatively free thinking? I don't know that actually. Yes, do you know what? That's a very good question. I don't think we have um, do we know strong evidence. We don't have any reason to think he grew up in a strictly religious household at all. We, he lived. He grew up in a fairly conventional household, so church would have been part of it. And and when he was, but there's there's no there's never any indication that he had to really rebel against his parents at all or his family. Um, right. His family were always quite accepting, and I think again it rather suggests the fact that. You know, at that kind of time, like, like a lot of these things, you know, there were the real zealots and the bigots and the church authorities. But a lot of the time in kind of more intellectual circles, there's a lot more tolerance. I mean, he had a lot of friends who were clerics, who had no problem at all with his religious views. 
So you know, at a personal level, I don't think it was a big problem. He was religious when he was younger, and he, he recounts in a letter, I think, how he, he spent quite a lot of time really trying to kind of, you know, prove that the Christian faith, prove to himself the Christian faith was actually true, because it kind of worried him that it might not be. And so he says, you know, that his, his loss of faith was something that happened with great difficulty and great reluctance, that he really worked at trying to keep it. Um, so I think that's, that's quite interesting in itself. He, he didn't mm. just kind of have the instinctive feeling this is a load of nonsense and he rebelled against it. He actually, he, he, in his own mind, he gave it up because he really, really tried to, to, to reconcile his intellect with it and he, he just couldn't. He couldn't. It. But he so. did say, didn't he, um, and I think it's something that you quote in the book, about he did sort of think that was a good thing that, that he, not only that he'd given up, but the society was giving it up generally, you know, and he would talked about the um, I suppose he was talking about enlightenment, really, as we would, you know, identify it. He talked about how um, these days, I don't know, I suppose some some point in the late 18th century, these days, people didn't take priests so seriously. They didn't take the divine right of kings seriously. They didn't take um, uh, these religions and um, political, you know, conservative opinions seriously. And that was a very good thing. Yeah, I, no, I, I think, think he, 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 clerics particularly. Yeah, no, no, he, wel he welcomed the fact that, uh, you know, I mean, he, he, he was, I mean, the curious thing, going back to what you're saying before, in some ways, he wasn't the kind of stereotypical, we're now to say, sort of angry atheist. But in other ways, a lot of things he says about Christian religion are really, really damning. And he's, he, he, he opposes both what he calls superstition and enthusiasm. And between right. them, you're basically covering the Anglican Church and the Roman Catholic Church, right? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, Catholicism was all about superstition. It's about, you know, smells and saints and rituals, and, you know, in his mind, by the way. No offence to any Roman Catholics in the room. We know that <laughs> Catholicism is actually very, very diverse than what people actually believe. But anyway, but that, 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 kind of, of, that kind of Catholicism, he, he really despised, although he could happily converse with Jesuit monks and use their library and their flesh and everything. So again, you know, he wasn't damning at all. But no. on, the, on the sort of Protestant side, there was this kind of enthusiasm, he called it, which is this real kind of puritanical zeal, which sort of like comes down at people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so he was very strongly against both those things and absolutely welcomed the weakening of, of clerical power and, and would, would, would wanted to see it go. I think there was that comment, yeah, so Adam Smith reported on some comments Hume made in his, his last days and there were two versions of this. And in one, he tones it down. In one, others it's stronger. But yeah, he said something he wanted to see. He looked forward to the end of um, superstition or something in, in society. So he was absolutely um, keen to, to, to end all of that. And it was, it was a tyranny. You've got to remember that within, well, not in, I'm not, I think not quite in his lifetime, but in the living memory of his lifetime, the last um, witch to be burned in, yeah. burned in you know? Exactly. I mean, this was recent history is extraordinary exactly. and of course within a couple of decades of his death there was going to be the evangelical revival and the in a way britain got more religious in the early 19th century than it had been in the course of his lifetime i suppose that's sort of an answer to, to sue's question actually in a way it's his his own uh, intellectual development is sort of like the journey of the spirit of the age really isn't it because he was sort of with the zeitgeist uh, and leading it, yeah. obviously, in some respects yeah, um, I think he was. And it is interesting that although, you know, he was threatened with sort of excommunication from the church, which would have, you know, caused problems. Yeah. Um, other, I mean, I'm not a biographer, you know, I, I'm, I'm, no, no. I'm referring to biographers, but uh, at least one sort of uh, the major biographers has suggested that actually, you know, the reason they didn't go through with this was that they would have looked ridiculous. They would have looked yeah. ridiculous. The exactly. eyes of the Scotland world. would have looked ridiculous. Scotland would have looked ridiculous to have like condemned one of its greatest, most celebrated writers mm. for for this kind of heresy. It would have made them look ridiculous. So that's what we say about the spirit of the age, because of course yeah, um, people exactly. don't look about don't, people don't worry about looking ridiculous in Tehran, for example. Yeah. No, quite. Richard Norman has got a question for oh, you. Hello, Richard. Nice to see you. You've talked about oh. Hume's conservatism being ultimately disappointing. I think we did say that. Um, how far do you think his famous irony makes him appear more conservative than he really was, actually? Uh, we're <laughs> That's trying to he's say very you. funny, isn't he? He's a funny guy, David. He, that says Richard Norman. He is a, he is a funny guy, but I, I don't think the irony can, can let him off this. I mean, okay. again, I think you seem to be a bit too 
kind of sincere. And I think, in a way, I mean, I, I wrote a piece on this, actually, the piece I wrote on Prospect, sometimes, you know, you read, you read pieces that come out at the same time as the book and they're basically bits of the book. The, the, the piece of Prospect was, was quite different. It drew on the book, but I tried to, to go into this a bit further. Why, why is it, how could it be that a great thinker like Hume could be so sort of disappointingly conservative? And I think there were two, two, two reasons, at least two reasons. Uh, one reason is that the kind of conservatism that he favoured was of the, the best kind of conservatism, actually. <laughs> you know, um, let, let's not sort of um, make any assumptions about the political commitments of people in this virtual room or conservatives in general. Uh, this kind of Burkean idea that society is a kind of a delicate ecosystem, almost like an organism, which you meddle with at your peril, is something which I think contains uh, quite a lot of truth. Now, it's often used as an excuse and a reason not to reform things that really need reform. Yeah. But we also know that a very violent and rapid reform of society can often lead to, at uh, the worst case, terror. Um, but in the other cases, you know, it's unforeseen circumstances. So he was the kind of the right kind of conservative. But I think the other thing is that... Scottish conservative. <laughs> in, 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 in philosophy, in a way. you know... He, Hume was, Hume was a, a skeptic, you know, of, of a, a kind of skeptic. And the skepticism he had was sort of like very much sort of putting our intellectual you know, pretensions in their place and very much sort of against wildly speculative grand theory, et cetera, et cetera. I think in philosophy, that's absolutely spot on and absolutely right. But I think you apply that kind of skepticism to, to the political arena and it errs too much on the side of caution yeah he ends up dismissing um you know what actually were probably good progressive courses on mm. the on the idea that well you know humans we always think we can do better don't we? we always think we can beat experience that's the other thing as well sorry more profound point hume of course thought that experience was a greater guide to exactly truth. and that's a that is a conservative force in anyone's thinking if you think that what it, what it is, but I think in philosophy, you know, in philosophy and everything, there's something really, really in that. You know, I think the, the philosophers who have thought that they could, you know, the rationalists like Descartes, Spinoza, I'd put Plato in that camp who thought, mm. you know, you could just sit down and think logically about things and, and they end up with castles in the sky. The best philosophers are always those ones who ground it in experience. The point is, in politics and society, that's not quite the same thing. So, I mean, when you're talking about the nature of cause and effect, for example, you're just observing the world and you're, the world, the natural world is as it is. But in politics and ethics, you're observing a social world which has a history and it was created. And it's not necessarily a very good guide to the way things could be or should be. So I think his kind of you know, experience-based skeptical philosophy really worked well for examining human nature in its essence, perhaps, and and things like causation and knowledge, it didn't work so well. When you're thinking about how we can best organize society, it led him to be just that bit too conservative. But did it affect his ethics and in terms of his, person, his ideas about personal ethics? You've implied there that somehow politics is, is and personal ethics were the two areas where this um, conservative uh, tendency might be damaging, but that's not my sense of his ethics, um, that it, it didn't harm. Although I suppose he's really more about, you know, I suppose in a way it is a bit conservative because his case for virtue being, you know, that it makes that the evidence is that it it's a, a happier way to be and a, a a more fulfilling way to be. And I suppose he's all about warmth and. Well, I think in his ethics, I mean, what's most what's most interesting about Hume's ethics today are not particular positions on applied topics, right? No. Um, which he does talk about in some of his essays, like you know, polygamy, divorce, marriage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What's most interesting about Hume's ethics today, and I think it is really still very powerful, is more of that kind of general question, what is the nature of ethics? Where mm -hmm. does ethics come from? And on that, his view was, 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 was very clear. You know, the idea that you could establish ethical principles by the application of reason and logical principles is, it just it doesn't happen. And, you know, people have still, people still pursue that project to a certain degree today. Yeah. You know, he, he makes a very, very realistic um, view, which is not, others at the time thought so as well, by the way, Adam Smith and other people, but it's rooted in you know, human sympathy. That's the basic yeah. thing. We have this fundamental ability and, and to feel, you know, put ourselves in the place of the other. And that is what motivates good thinking. The, the reason, the rational aspect only comes in with what follows from that. So 
Um, so, so that kind of framework of ethics, which people still find rather shocking because they think if that's all it is, oh my God, you know, then, then it's subjective, isn't it? It's not absolute. That's why he's so popular with humanists, you know, when, when they encounter him today, but also historically, you know, he's very much admired by generations of humanists in particular, I think, for, for precisely that attitude and that grounding of... of yeah, but I mean, but it scares a lot of people because it means yes. that it means that there's no objective basis yeah, yeah, for yeah. ethics. I, by the way, and that's a debate where we can talk about another time. I think that's a bit of a red herring because I think that you know the idea that ethics needs an objective basis, objective meaning, not at all being rooted in human nature and human experience is just uh, what we, what even does that mean? I know. But I there's a lot. Understand. There's a lot that is objective in ethics in the sense that it is an objective fact. For example that there is no superiority of that one gender has over the other or, or one race has over another. Um, it is a matter of a fact, for example, that, um, you know, we, 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 as we understand better animal cognition and animal sentience, that affects the way we treat people. Ethically. So there's, there's, there are a lot of objective facts and truths which inform our ethical thinking. What's not an objective fact is simply the fact that we have that motivation to take into account people's suffering and flourishing. Um, but if you if you if you want that to be rooted in something you know transcendental and divine, then you, you, you're looking in the wrong place. I think. Yeah, I think today some people try to to make a fact out of that, don't they? In terms of social instincts and. Well, yeah, but I mean, but then you don't get, human then you've nature. got the other, I mean, Hume very famously made this distinction between, you know, what is and what ought to be. Yes, Again, this I don't, very, very I don't like that. Um, <laughs> I think that's got, I no, think that gets in the way a lot. Well, I think it's going to be misused and abused because if you think yes. about it, you look, so, okay, so again, don't listen, make no assume prior, assume prior knowledge here. So he was, Hume observes that people start talking about the way things are and the way things is, and they slide into saying how they should be. And what he's really saying is that nothing follows, strictly speaking, from what is to what ought to be. They're two different kinds of statement, right? And I think that's true. That's a logical point. Now, the point is this so-called is-ought gap has led people, I think, to the, the, a kind of very standard interpretation of that is that you're not going to get anywhere from ethics simply by studying sort of you know nature and the way things are but that mm. wasn't Hume's point Hume's point was a logical point about what follows and if you think about it given that his whole basis of his morality was a natural fact about human sympathy you know either he was completely inconsistent or he understood that in making this distinction He's not saying that, uh, but what, 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 all he's saying is that <clears throat> when you make that uh, leap, as it were, from, you know, we have human sympathy, blah, 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 and that therefore we, we, we ought to act on that, mm. that mm. you're not getting to the ought biological step, right? Mm. It's not logic taking you there, it's something else. But I that's, it, but you have to get there. <laughs> That's how you get there. You start by, um, yeah, recognizing. Now here's something. an interesting question given that. I mean, you just, the, the, put, the, the, the thinker that I always think of almost immediately, apart from David Hume, when, when I think about that idea, that idea that um, morality comes out of sympathy and empathy or, or can, is um, Mencius, of course, the, uh, the post-Confucian oh, yeah. Chinese thinker who says exactly the same thing. And, you know, in yeah. fact, I think someone in the 19th century even called him the, the Chinese David Hume. It's, it's so uh, similar. Um, there's a question here. Does Hume owe a debt to Buddhists or other Asian philosophers? Oh, well, there's a particular reason why one might think that, which we'll come into. OK, so this <laughs> is a very interesting question. I think the person who asked this knows um, knows something. And what they ah. know is, first of all, that Hume's view of the nature of the self is very, very similar to the, uh, you know, the Buddhist view of the self, um, sometimes called the no-self view. Hmm. but I think rather misleadingly. So the idea is simple, that, <laughs> simple. <laughs> that you know, a lot Go of people <laughs> intuitively, intuitively believe that the selfhood must reside in some kind of you know, thing, some kind of soul or singular entity, as it were. Um, whereas in fact, uh, Hume, very much arguing against Descartes without naming him, kind of says that's not the case. And he says, you can find this out for yourself, right? So, you know, sit down in a quiet room one day or even do it now. Um, 
it's actually a bit disconcerting if you do it now. If I start doing it now, I'm going to start not being able to talk coherently because I'm going to become very self-conscious. You observe yourself, observe yourself, observe your own experience and see if you can observe the, the eye, which is, um, see if you can find the eye, <laughs> as it were, not the eye, but the, the eye, the little eye. And, and, and you sit there and you do that. And what you notice is that um, you can't do that. You notice a particular thought, you notice a, a little feeling in your leg, you notice a slightly warmer sensation where the sun's been on your shirt. You, you, what, what, the only things you notice are like individual thoughts, sensations, experiences, feelings, etc. And you don't notice, there's, there's, no, there's no I which has them that you, that you observe. And so the idea is that the self is simply all these things. Now, these things relate to each other, they're ordered in some way, there's a coherence, they do sort of bundle together, hence the bundle theory. But there is no sort of I behind them, and that's pretty much exactly the Buddhist view. Now, is, do, is, does Hume owe this to the Buddhists is an interesting question. And that's become an interesting question in particular because of an interesting essay written by, someone can put the name in the chat because the, the names escape me all of a sudden, um, a, a, an American psychologist, I think, actually. And she was fascinated by this. And as I said earlier, Hume actually spent a lot of time in La Fleche, which was a Jesuit monastery in, in France, as he was writing his book, where he first discussed these ideas. And Jesuits had been to India, and they had come back. Of, of, one of them had written a whole treatise in which he explained the Buddhist ideas of selfhood and everything. This Jesuit had passed through the monastery where flesh uh, Hume had been for a reasonable period, it seems, although not apparently at the same time as Hume was there. So there is, the, in terms of the ideas, they seem remarkably similar. And in terms of potential connection, the circumstantial evidence is that, um, you know, he, he could have been told about these from the, the monks, or maybe even the manuscript of this guy's book, which was not allowed to be published because it was heretical. But, you know, right. the Jesuits often kept these things in their library. They didn't care. Um, they, were, they were quite free thinking. So it's possible, but it just remains pure speculation. Now, if, if he did, if, if there was, if he did get it from that, you might have thought there'd be some kind of recognition of it. And here again, you might say, well, maybe not, because he was a man of his time. He wouldn't have wanted to acknowledge a debt to, to Indians. Well, that's quite know. common. I mean, there was a very good book um, a few years ago. Um, it might be more than a few. It might be like 20 years ago, actually, called Oriental Enlightenment, which mm. tracked some of the Im impacts of some of the ideas from India and China, which often came from Jesuits and from those encounters um, on Western philosophy. Um, and, and on particular Western philosophers, mm. and demonstrated how again and again, actually, this this debt was completely unacknowledged, and yeah. it was just a you know, um, I don't know if it was like you just suggest sort of slightly taboo even to suggest that you'd borrowed yeah. something from these yeah. civilizations, but that that yeah, did I, happen. I, I, I think exactly. So 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 it is it is possible, but the bottom line is this: the evidence is purely circumstantial. But the point is, we don't need that explanation to give us why Hume came to these views, right? Because that's for two, two reasons. First of all, um, the reason why this view is fundamentally correct is that it is the view I think you come to if you observe carefully and properly the nature of self-experience, right? So that any, any, it, you know, it, it didn't take a particularly enlightened figure in India to, to, work, to work this out. Um, it was going to be worked out by other people independently. And the second point here, is the you know there are many ways in which Hume's view is a kind of development of John Locke's. You know, it, it's it's not out of nowhere. It's not like this emerged in a complete vacuum, right? So Locke already had the view of personal identity as being a matter matter of uh, mental continu psychological continuity, essentially, and about being the relations between different mental experiences. So we already had an idea of personal identity which was rooted. In, in psychological experience rather than any underlying substance because you know, Locke had already concluded that personal identity was neither a matter of the same body or the same soul. So, so because you can see it as a natural development of Locke and because it's something that you know, a smart person was going to observe, we don't need uh, the Buddhist influence to explain how Hume got the idea. But it remains one of those intriguing 
possibilities. And, yes. you know, and it might maybe one day we'll discover that missing letter or something which will make us go. <laughs> Alison Gopnik. Alison Gopnik. Gopnik. Well people done. are Alison saying Gopnik. in the chat. There Thank you go. You. Okay. That is correct. Yeah. Lovely essay. Look it up. Look it up. It's a really lovely essay she's written. And it also is a good one because she talks about how this isn't just an intellectual who done it. She actually talks about how this helped her in the time of personal crisis. Yeah, crisis. Yes, yeah. Now, um, we'll come on in a moment back to the Scottishness of Hume because there's two questions here about that in, in different ways. But first of all, um, David said, I read somewhere recently Hume was in favour of slavery or perhaps even kept slaves. This was apparently only on Earth recently. I hope this isn't true. Is there any truth in it? Was that, did that, was that some of the chatter around the time of the, the, his yeah. footnote being re-exposed? Well, Lots well, of Scottish people own shares in, uh, in, in no, slavery, okay. didn't they? Yeah, a scholar came up with something which was, does, doesn't look good at all. In terms of support for slavery, he's, he's definitely against it. Um, he wrote explicitly that he was against slavery. He thought it was barbaric mm. and awful. Now, at the same time, um, the, the incident which was uncovered was that he seemed to, like as a favour to one friend, encourage another friend to invest in a plantation. Okay. Yeah. And of course the plantation would have been uh, uh, worked by slaves and Hume would have known that. So he, he is going to encourage someone to invest in a plantation. Now, again, I mean, in a way, I don't find that as shocking as the, um, the the comment, the footnote, and it's for this reason. Today, I would like to know how many people would put their hands up and say that you know their investments, if they have investments, mm. are avoiding the things that today we know are pretty awful, and we could do something about if we really made the effort. I think there's a tendency to sort of take certain things as facts of life so you know if you go back even a few years ago i think a lot of people would have said that you know it's it's not fossil fuels are part of the world as it is at the moment we want to get rid of them but as things stand at the moment you know it's unrealistic to sort of pull out your investments from it and what difference would that make anyway you, well, know, you can stick I with think, slavery actually julian i mean you could you stick can, with you slavery if you wanted to like because we're all buying things made by slaves and we're all you know living off the profits of things owned by slaves who are slaving as we speak you know so yeah for, for, for me one of the one of the most uh, obvious things actually is animal cruelty i'm not yeah, i'm not a, not, I'm not, a vegan, I'm not a vegetarian but i i i, I am I, I fall in that camp which both sides hate i i am a conscientious omnivore which vegans and vegetarians scoff at and say it's not possible and meat is just think it's just kind of like you know being a bit whatever but Lily I, I, I stand by that and I'd argue for that another day. And, and vegans, vegans may have a right to get upset, but vegetarians don't, because of course, um, <laughs> dairy involves killing and suffering, right? So, but but um, but, you, so, but, but, yeah, but people, that... people make, but people knowing knowing people know about industrial farming, exactly. And, and the vast majority of people don't make any effort at all to avoid buying these products, zero. So, although you know, vegans, vegetarians, at least they're making an effort, right? Um, yeah. Most people are not. So, and. and <laughs> Also, there's this strange thing, isn't there, that, you know, in a society where this is happening anyway, a friend asks you to ask a friend to invest in a project, you know, you have that kind of... You wouldn't think of, give it a second thought, really, yeah. yeah. He probably wouldn't have done. So, again, it doesn't no. reflect brilliantly on him. But to be honest with you, I think that, again, if, you, if you're at all thinking in a way which gives, makes allowances for the time, this, I mm. think, is very minor compared to the explicit endorsement of a racial superiority theory. In the footnote. Well, if you're watching this, by the way, if you're participating in this, you can go to Anti Slavery International's website, which has some great links to help you eliminate slavery from your own personal supply chain. Good. Gives you countries where different products that you might buy, there's a, a large use of um, either enslaved or indentured labour in the supply chain, clothes from certain countries, agricultural produce from certain countries, and so on and so forth. Um, because really, we're doing the same thing today, all of us. Um, everyone who's got an iPhone, I believe, is doing that. So yeah, I'm, um, I'm doing that now. I would like to know. I'd like to know. You know what? You know, I, I'm aware of the fact that I, I, to date, I have made no effort at all to try and eliminate Uyghur slave labour from my right. And, and it's very thing, easy right? actually to do. Yeah. So we can you can Google that. Let Let's all the 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 130 people who are here or whatever. Um, let's all do that. We'll make the world a better place yeah. tonight. Okay. Um, this is a good two questions here. Um, one simply says. Scott, Brit or European, question mark. 
And the other, the other says, would Hume be in favour of present day Scottish nationalism? I think we know the answers to both these questions. Didn't he call Scotland North Britain? I thought he always uh, called it North, North Britain throughout his life, didn't he? That's what I learned anyway as an undergraduate historian. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think it's really interesting. I, I don't know. I, on that, I don't know what he would think today. I mean, today, right? Was, we just don't. We just don't know. Now, he was a proud Scot, but at the same time, he was also against what he called these Scotticisms. These are uh, um, the, the Scottish sort of variations of English. He made a list of them and thought they should be kind of uh, banished. At the same time, he, he was really down on Londoners, so that made him very much in tune with people today. He talked about the yeah. barbarians of the, of the Thames on more than one occasion. He really thought that it's London fair. was a, was a yeah, a, a, he didn't like London. He didn't like Londoners. He thought it was a kind of very Philistine place. Um, he was happy in Edinburgh and he was happy in Paris, you know, and he thought he loved France and he loved Paris. So absolutely a European. I, I think he was, I think he probably fair to say more of a Britain than a Scot. Mm. Uh, but but then who knows because the thing is I don't I have no idea really how the politics of the time was around this and if you think about the relationship between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom it's changed in my lifetime hasn't it uh, well during Hume's people... lifetime it was a very it was still a very live issue yeah. I mean certainly in his youth and it was a it was more it was a recent event it would have been the act of union would have been as recent to him as I don't know some like the second world war to us really wouldn't it now yeah, I mean it would have, yeah, it was I mean, a, a historic um, and I believe he did always refer to North Britain. I think. I mean, I might be, I might be I'm, wrong I'm about sure. that. I, I, I mean, you you got me there, Andrew, because I, I mean, I've read all his lessons, all that kind of stuff. I I, I don't. It doesn't ring any bells with me. To no. Be oh, okay. So so I'm not sure whether I, I, I'm sure. I'm misinformed. Be right no, that. no. I'm. I think I am misinformed. Or, or, from that case. or maybe no, maybe not. But the other thing was in his histories. The histories are, you know, maybe he does in his histories. I don't know. That is possible. I mean, I think it was technically called North Britain at the time because there was this period right. in the 18th century when um, when there was an attempt to sort of eliminate the the idea of Scotland um, and uh, and render it sort of North Britain um, and I think that oh, there you go so it, it, it's uh, someone's telling me that um, yeah in his history of England he did right uh, talk that was about North, North Britain. Britain yeah yeah and he okay. was aged four at the Act of Union. I think that's quite interesting, really, because that means to, to him it was like the minor strike to me or something. I don't know what, when you were four. <laughs> when were you four? Do you know what was going on when you were four? When I was four, it was the three-day week. Um, there you go. Think... And you know that, don't you? That's part of your cultural yeah, knowledge. True. So, I mean, the true. idea that this extremely controversial, you know, and um, nation-building act would have happened when he was a, mm. uh, a child, I think that's quite important when you think about um, national identity and, and his national identity in particular. Now, I'm, with this question, next question, I think goes with that saying almost, although maybe you'll surprise us, but um, do you think we should continue to honour human um, and not cancel him? I don't know what that means, can, um, by renaming buildings. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, this is yeah. a reference to what people call cancelling people when you um, yeah, yeah. change the names yeah. of things or take down statues and things. Um, well, what do you yeah, think? Honor is, on, well, honour is an interesting term, isn't it? I mean, I, I kind of think that... Yes, that might be a false dichotomy, actually. Honour I mean, versus no cancel. One, no one should be put on a pedestal, right? I mean, Hume uh, is, is a human being with lots of flaws. And I think that, you know, his kind of worldview was one which embraced that. One quote I've got of his, which I've used a bit recently, is, um, you know, something like, the, the majority of humankind exists betwixt vice and virtue, right? You know, he kind of knew that no one was an angel and very few people were complete devils. And so I think the kind of, you know, to, uh, one thing I wouldn't want to do is say that because Hume is probably the single philosopher who's most resonate with the most admire, yeah, you know, what happens, I, I find it really frustrating when people well, none that, that, with p people like that, they will try to find every excuse mm. in a book to defend them against their weaknesses rather than say, yeah, well, that was a weakness. I mean, you yeah. know, Gandhi, Gandhi was a racist. He didn't like, you know, he's very a very racist. Yeah, about absolutely. Black people and everything. And, you know, the, the part of the problem, <laughs> the story of the renaming of the tower has a kind of slightly comic twist to it, actually, because the first suggestion um, for who uh, they should name it for instead 
was, I think it was the Tanzanian liberation leader. He <laughs> turned out to be a complete homophobe, right? Yeah. So, well, so, that imagine, happens a lot when they go yeah, through Wilberforce, so, you know, when people try and name, rename things after Wilberforce on the grounds that yeah. he led the campaign against slavery. And they forget exactly. he was, you know, a great um, proponent of anti-sodomy laws, of censorship laws, of all sorts yeah, of other things. Exactly. So basically, unless we name, we can name things only after Nelson Mandela, as far as I'm concerned, because I mean, he seems to be one of the... <laughs> and he was a terrorist, few... Julian, I don't know if you've heard. <laughs> So <laughs> you, see, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, they're, 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 so, so I think I, 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 but you know, but at the same time, it is important that we don't kind of uh, whitewash this stuff and yeah. and idealize these figures. And you know, in general, I think when it comes to Maria, I, I, the thing I'm uncomfortable with. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm reluctant to talk about this because you know, I am a I am a cisgender heterosexual white man. Okay. So, okay, I can point to some, if you want to get a go, might, might get a bit of kudos for some of my social class origins, but, you know, basically, I'm in the privileged kind of group. And I don't like to kind of talk about these issues in ways that at all suggest that my view is the first one to be heard. And, you know, and I, I would, you know, I think it's very important that in, in, in coming to resolutions about this, you do have to listen primarily first, but not exclusively, to people who are more affected by, by these, these legacies. But my concern with, um, you know, first of all, you set the bar too high, we can't admire anybody. But mm. secondly, in terms of memory, I think it's a kind of case by case kind of situation here because I, I think we should be remembering the bad as well as the good. And I live in Bristol, which is, this has been a big, big issue in Bristol. So although I'm, you know, I think that given, given the uh, failure of, campaigns which went on for years to put a more informative um, panel at Clack the bottom Colston. of the mm. uh, statue. Mm. Its removal, I think, is perfectly understandable. But the mm. wholesale removal of the name Colston from streets and buildings, I'm not sure about that because that's how people learn about their history. Why, why is it called Colston Tower? Colston, well, there you go. And, and people hear about it. So I think this is a tricky, tricky, delicate one. But in terms but of things, things do look, change, no. don't they? I mean, things change all the time. We don't have, we don't have now nearly as many sort of providence ways or providence houses or providence because providence as a concept has gone the way of lots of others in the last couple of hundred years. And so yeah, things will change, you know, I, won't they? they? They will. And I think it's right. I think, you know, I think we should be looking more to, and in terms of statues, look, there's a lot, a lot of statues are completely ridiculous. You know, somebody in 1837, um, their, their, their family stumped up the money to put a statue to them. Why is it still there? It's not doing any good at all. So I'm, I'm not saying, oh, we should never touch it, blah, blah, blah. But I think we mm. should sort of tread carefully. And, and with Hume, as I say, the, the point is that I think that if you look at the essence of his philosophy and everything, you've got something which is very, very humane, very useful yeah. for us today. And you've got someone who in lots of ways, in lots of ways is admirable. And I think we should just sort of recognize along with that his flaws and his faults rather than say that means we can't we have to chuck out everything you know mm. Mm. excellent well i hope that everyone i hope and trust and i'm certain in fact that everyone who is here will be rushing out actually can you buy it yet is it published you can it was published on okay. tuesday oh, it's on Tuesday. Okay. yeah don't 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 buy it from, I, I always say please don't buy it from amazon you know um Bookshop UK, Hive UK, or your local high street bookshop. Or, Hive UK. is excellent for local, yes, local independent bookshops. And you can yeah. go out now, you can leave your home and go to your local bookshop and buy books. Yeah. Um, and so do yeah. do that by The Great Guy by amazing, Julian Bagini. There's this amazing technology, Andrew, actually, whereby you can, you can get a phone the next day. You, you phone up the bookshop and they normally can get it for you the next day. It's amazing. That's and amazing. you don't have to be in and they don't shove it wet into something. Anyway. Everybody will buy it that way, I'm sure. If they don't, um, they'll buy it some other way. I'm certain of that. It's an excellent book. And thank you very much for joining us to talk about it. Thank you, everyone who asked their uh, excellent questions. And lots of people are saying thank you in the chat. Thank you very much uh, to thank them you. too. And see everybody next time. I'm not quite sure who we're talking to next time, but I'm sure you'll get an email about it. Uh, thanks, Julian. Thanks so much. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Cheerio. Bye-bye.